Uh, Dr. Manas, we should start now. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning, uh, dear delegates and all respected faculties. It's time that we start. So today will be the first session will be taken by Dr. Manas Kalva. Uh, he is the consultant hematologist at uh, Sir Ganganam Hospital. And uh, I request him to please share his presentation and start. I hope the screen is visible to everyone. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Screen is visible. Good Please go. Sir, screen is visible and I'm audible. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so first of all, I would like to thank uh, uh, the organizing team for giving me this opportunity for organizing this uh, important certificate uh, course in hematology and it simply it is uh, just uh, you know overwhelming that so many people are interested in hematology uh, it was just amazing to know that we had like 400 registrations and they were still more pouring in and uh, uh, the organizers actually had to stop taking in more registrations and there is already a big queue for uh, the next session that will happen soon. So thank you, Dr. Ajay, Dr. Vipul, Dr. all the uh, senior uh, members who have um, organized this program. So I have been given the task to speak about ABC of CBC. And in the next hour or so, I would like to uh, take you through all the parameters of uh, uh, blood count that you see in your Coulter report. Uh, sometimes we just look at the Coulter report and don't give uh, much of importance to it. And, uh, you know, we are just tuned to seeing um, uh, hemoglobin, MCV, TLC, platelet count, and then we say, okay, we have looked at it. Some of the reports that come through various, um, uh, you know, labs are so complex and complicated that, you know, it is just a huge, huge list of uh, numbers and it is quite jumbling. And even for an experienced hematologist, it can be quite... Uh, uh, perplexing to go through all the uh, parameters and it can and I'll try to simplify all those things um, and uh, uh, you know there will be a few things which are not uh, very commonly used and I'll emphasize that these are not something very commonly a pediatrician has to use um, so those who are very well versed with the general CBC parameters will be benefited with those newer advanced parameters. And those who are still into you know, the early phases of training can stick to the basic uh, CBC parameters. And uh, I'm pretty sure that you know, this is going to help you uh, through the journey of making right diagnosis for your patients uh, for hematological conditions and for non-hematological conditions as well. Um, uh, so again, thank you for this opportunity. I work at Sir Gangaram Hospital, um, uh, where we have state of art hematology center, and this is uh, my hospital in the heart of Delhi. Uh, and I bring greetings from this hospital. So let's look at um, uh, uh, CBCs. So you know, if you look at age specific indices, this is very important for a pediatrician because a pediatrician um, has to look after a newborn, has to look after a, a, a toddler has to look after a grown-up child, a teenager, an adolescent, and sometimes even an adult. So, you know, uh, it is very important to understand that CBC keeps changing with the age. And, you know, for the adult guy who just sees above 18 patients, you know, his, his life is simple. But for a pediatrician, the life is not simple. So if we really look at it, you see the term baby has got a very high hemoglobin, a high retic count. And this kind of goes down. You can see that how the hemoglobin goes down, the retic count goes down. So one needs to appreciate that a high hemoglobin, high retic count is normal for a baby. You see that the hemoglobin reaches its nadir, say around two to three months because of the physiological anemia of infancy. You see that the macrocytosis that is normal for a, um, a newborn uh, child, you know, kind of goes down and, and stays somewhere around 70, 80, um, um, uh, 85 for an older uh, child. And you can also appreciate that 
even uh, this MCV can drop down up to 70, 75. And, and a similar thing happens with lymphocyte counts because uh, children will, can have, you know, younger children can have uh, a, a lymphocytic response, which is like normal. And, you know, this not, should not be confused with a very alarming disease. And if we have the knowledge of uh, how these things change with the age, uh, it can help us to interpret the CBC uh, appropriately. So I'll take you through cases and take you through all the uh, parameters in CBC. So this is a three-year-old girl who is a poor eater who is bottle fed and presents to a pediatrician for a routine checkup where he finds that the child is pale and he orders a CBC. So when he orders a CBC, you get a hemoglobin, TLC and platelet count. So please tune your mind to look at hemoglobin TLC platelet count first and then you know you if there is anemia you go down look at all the uh, RBC indices then you look at WBC and then you look at all the differential count for WBC and this will kind of not uh, you know really not miss any important parameter so when you see that the hemoglobin is low the TLC is kind of okay platelet is a little bit high-ish then you need to understand that this patient has anemia and this anemia needs a classification. So just to have a WHO classification with you in your OPD can be very helpful. And you know that, you know, sometimes we think, okay, this is not anemic because we are kind of used to looking at 11 hemoglobin as a normal. But please um, uh, see that, you know, if you have a, a, a range of 11 to 11.4, this is actually mild anemia. You know, so don't just say that, okay, it is 11, then it is fine. Please have these ranges with you. And this child clearly has got a severe anemia because the hemoglobin is um, uh, below seven. So uh, uh, anytime you see a hemoglobin which is low, your mind should automatically calculate what degree of anemia it is. And when you look at anemia, we need to look at other RBC parameters that are available in the CBC. And that is why you look at MCV and RDW. These are the two most important parameters that help you classify anemia. And I show you this with the help of the cases. So if you have MCV, which is low, you will either have microcytic anemia, normocytic anemia, or macrocytic anemia. And then whenever you have a microcytic anemia, you look at whether the RDW is normal or RDW is high. MCV, again, you look at those normal, again, you look at those things. And if you have a macrocytic anemia, you are again looking at whether the RDW is high or RDW is low. And this is very important, and we'll show you with the help of cases. So in this particular case, where I gave you the hemoglobin, I gave you the TLC, and I gave you the platelet. Now you saw that the child had severe anemia. When the child has severe anemia, you look at all the other RBC parameters. So you can see that the child has microcytosis because the MCV is low, the RDW is high. So these were the two most important parameters I told you. So there is microcytosis and high RDW. So what is your impression? that most likely this child has a severe iron deficiency anemia. That is what we would commonly think whenever we see a microcytic anemia. So how do you interpret MCV on the bedside? Because this is very clear cut, but you can have borderline MCVs and then you would have to fumble, open Google, find the MCV, and then, you know, kind of say whether this is a low MCV or this is high MCV. So there are bedside interpretation methods. If you have these formulas with you, so lower limit of MCV is 70 plus age. So if you have a five-year-old child and your MCV is less than 75, that means there is microcytosis. What is the upper limit? 84 plus 0.6 multiplied by age. So for a 10-year-old child, when you multiply 10 into 0.6, it will give you 6. So 84 plus 6 is 90. Anything above 90 is macrocytosis. So you can use these two formulas and calculate microcytosis or macrocytosis for your patients. This is usually valid for two to 10 years of age and anything beyond 90, beyond 10 years is considered as macrocytosis. So in this picture, you can see a clear cut microcytic hypochromic anemia. Why do I call this that? Because you see that the central pallor is more than two third and also the size of many of these RBCs is actually smaller than the nucleus of a middle lymphocyte or a, a lymphocyte is smaller than the lymphocyte. And if that is seen in your peripheral smear picture, you know there is microcytosis and there is hypochromic. So microcytosis reflects the size, hypochromic reflects the central pallor. So these terminologies, as we keep moving on, you'll keep get, getting familiar with all the terminologies. So you now know how to calculate MCV on the bedside. 
you now know that if you see a picture of CBC, how will you interpret the basic picture of iron deficiency? And you also know that anemias, we classify them using MCV and RDW. Okay. So now this is a red cell distribution histogram. It is very important to understand that when you see plot the size of all the um, uh, RBCs, and when you plot them, then the middle part here reflects the average MCV of the whole population. You can have some cells here. You can have some cells here. If this graph goes more towards that side, that means the patient has microcytosis. If this graph goes more towards this side, that means the patient has macrocytosis because the average value will increase. And if you have cells all over the place, cells of different sizes, some are very small, large, middle, all sorts of sizes are present and there is a lot of variation, then that kind of tells you that the patient has got an isocytosis and in these cases, the RDW will be high. So you now know what is microcytosis, what is hypochromia, and you know that if the dispersion of the cell size is too much, then the RDW will be very, very high. So MCV RDW kind of form the basis of interpretation of any patient with anemia and that we saw with the help of the classification as well. So RDW ranges from 11.5 to 14.5 in the CV range and if you use the standard deviation then it is 38 to 46. We generally stick to the CV and if it is more than uh, say 14.5 we call it a high RDW. Now where does RDW go up? RDW goes up when you have patients of nutritional anemia so whether it is iron deficiency, whether it is B12, folic acid, and even in patients with thalassemia major, where you know it is a dirty slide with cells broken and going all haywire, you will have a very high RDW. Now, please remember, very, very important, that thalassemia minor, if you have a pure thalassemia minor, in those cases, your RDW is generally normal. You will have a low MCV, you will have a normal uh, uh, RDW, and you will have a RBC count which will be higher for the degree of anemia. In thalassemia minor, okay, this does not stand for intermedia or major patients, okay. So I hope now you have understood what is MCV, RDW and their importance in this patient. So let's go back to our index case. You have this girl who has you know, you know all the history of poor feeding and, you know, mainly feeding milk. And this child has got a hemoglobin, which is low, MCV low, RDW is high. So, you know, this is microcytic anemia and uh, there is a lot of dispersion of the cells. Now, do you want any more information before you say, oh, this is classical iron deficiency anemia? So, you know, you'll always look at the graphs and sometimes the graphs are not available, but we hematologists are kind of fond of looking at the graphs. So this helps us with the MCV and this helps us to look at the distribution. And you, and as I said, that if you have microcytosis, the curve will shift towards this side. If you have macrocytosis, the curve will shift towards that side. So in this particular patient, when we identified that the RDW was high and the MCV was low, we looked at the next RBC, important RBC parameter, which is the RBC count. Now, what is atypical in this patient? If you have a pure iron deficiency, the RBC count will be low because the RBCs are not getting enough iron for the production. So, but here you see that the RBC count is high. Okay, so RBC count being high means that there is actually a lot of production going on in this patient. So that means it is not a pure iron deficiency. There is something else going on. And if you look at North India and certain populations, we have four to 5% patients who have got thalassemia minor. And that is one of the most important reasons why the RBC count is higher in this patient. Now, please remember for all the trainees that thalassemia major doesn't have iron deficiency. Thalassemia intermedia doesn't have iron deficiency, but thalassemia minor can have iron deficiency. You know, 70% of India has iron deficiency and even thalassemia minor patients, if you take all the thalassemia minor patients, 70 to 80% will be iron deficient. So sometimes, you know, we have the, we come across this uh, question that, oh, this patient has thalassemia, how can we give iron? Because it is thalassemia minor. So thalassemia minor can also have concurrent iron deficiency. Why I am saying there is concurrent iron deficiency? Because you see that in a pure thalassemia minor, 
RDW is not raised. The cells are all uniformly small. So MCV will be small. So MCV will be low. So the cells will be really small. But the RDW getting higher kind of tells you that there may be an associated iron deficiency. And also this child's diet kind of tells you that, you know, it's not a good diet and there may be an associated iron deficiency. So often the picture that we see in our clinic is not a pure thalminer or a pure iron deficiency. It can be a mixed picture. So look at the RBC count and that will tell you the importance, okay? So there is something called as a rule of three. What is this rule of three? Rule of three is if you multiply RBC with uh, three, the number of RBC, you should get the hemoglobin. If you multiply hemoglobin with three, you will get the hematocrit. Now, in this case, you see that the RBC count was 5.5. So the hemoglobin should have been 15, but that is not happening. So that clearly tells you that the rule of three is not being followed. Whereas in pure iron deficiency, generally, you know, you will have something like 2 million RBC. That means the hemoglobin will be somewhere around six. Okay, so the rule of three will be followed in cases of iron deficiency, but not in cases of thalassemia minor, because here the RBCs are being uh, produced very rapidly because of the underlying disease. Okay, so I hope I have made this clear. So you have now looked at MCV, RDW, RBC count, uh, basic classification on, on anemia with this first case. So after you give iron therapy to this patient, now you see that the hemoglobin has gone up. It's nice and beautiful, 10.5. Not really ideal, but at least it went up from 6.5. And now the child is eating, the child is okay. But mother is still worried. Why? Because the MCV is still low. She says, oh, doctor, there is all these uh, CBC parameters are coming as marked red or black, you know, dark black. Then in that case, you can explain to the patient that, see, this child has thalassemia minor. That is why you see the RBC count is 5 or 6 million. The MCV will always remain low. The RDW has now become normal because, you know, you have kind of corrected the iron deficiency. And now this is going to be the CBC picture of this patient for the rest of the uh, life. And it is very important because of antenatal counseling so that whenever this patient gets uh, married, if the partner also has thalassemia minor, then it can have implications for their uh, baby. So this is typical of thalassemia minor, a high RBC count, a low RD, a normal RDW and a very low MCV. Okay, and a concomitant iron deficiency can make the picture confusing. So how do you confirm the iron deficiency? So ideally, they say that the HPLC should be done after the correction of iron deficiency. Why is that? Because, you know, um, uh, in a case of thalassemia minor, so this HPLC shows you a patient with thalassemia minor, the HBA2 is 4% here, you can see. So anything above 3.5 usually points towards a thalassemia minor. So if you have a high HBA2, it is thalassemia minor. But if the patient has severe iron deficiency, suppose this patient's hemoglobin is 5 or 6, he will not have enough iron to produce HbA2. So what will happen? HbA2 will come as 3. And you'll say, oh, this patient doesn't have thalassemia minor. But that is actually a mistake because once you give iron, once you feed the patient, once you give iron, this HbA2 also will rise to its, no, its, its actual value in that patient. And if this patient has thalassemia minor, you will then see a peak coming above 3.5%. So by error, by, 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 by judging the fact that, okay, this patient's uh, thalassemia minor is um, negative, you will actually be wrong, wrongly counseling the patient. So always treat the iron deficiency first, correct the iron deficiency, then you will get the proper HbA2 peak, and then you can say whether this patient has got a thalassemia minor or not. Okay. Another important parameter that you know we can calculate is MCA is MCV by RBC count, which is Menzer index. I'm not going into all the other indices because it gets confusing, but at least Menzer index is something that you should know. So what happens in Menzer index? It is you, you will see that in thalassemia minor, the RBC count is very high. So the denominator becomes high, the value goes less than 30. Now, in case of iron deficiency, you will again have microcytosis. So in both the cases, you see that the MCV is somewhere around 50, 60, 
65 and you see that the numerator is constant. I've kept the numerator constant and the RBC count is very high in thal minor, whereas the RBC count is low in cases of iron deficiency. And when the RBC count becomes low, the numerator becomes a Above 13, above 13, and that is when we say that the Menzer index is high in cases of iron deficiency. So all these are very practical tips in your day-to-day -day OPD practice. If you use them, you will not miss iron deficiency. You will not miss um, uh, thalassemia minor, and you will not miss the concomitant presence of both the uh, things. And you know, we can always discuss if you have questions about this later in a chat or an email or uh, via WhatsApp, and we can help you if this can, if this is confusing for some of our uh, delegates present today. Please remember, don't use Menzer index if the patient has severe anemia. A Menzer index has to be used only when you have mild anemia. I often see residents, you know, jumping to calculate Menzer index when a patient comes with a hemoglobin of seven. It is not relevant. It is only for mild anemia. Okay, so if you have iron deficiency plus thalassemia minor both and leading to severe anemia, don't look at Menzer index. Calculate it later when you have corrected the iron deficiency and then you'll get the real picture. Now, there are some newer parameters. So, you know, in the beginning of my talk, I said that for a, a general pediatric practice, maybe, you know, we don't need to know all the, all the newer parameters and all the fancy parameters. And you are seeing the CBC report with 40, 50 parameters. But those who already know a lot about, um, uh, you know, basic hematology may be benefited by the newer parameters. And as, uh, uh, you know, we are discussing CBC in 2023, it is my duty to kind of tell uh, some of the students who are really keen on hematology about little bit about the newer parameters and um, you know these are not really very very uh, important on a day-to-day -day practice when you are managing your pediatric patients and I'll just briefly tell them not going to too much detail so traditional RBC indices are not sensitive indicators for early iron deficient erythropoiesis so you know just recent onset I early iron deficient erythropoiesis may be missed by your common parameters and now a lot of modern parameters have come up which kind of indicate uh, what is happening to the um, quality of erythropoiesis and not just the quantity of the erythropoiesis. The ideal test for assessing iron available for erythropoiesis would be one that measures the availability of iron at the point of hemoglobin synthesis in the RBC precursor, so reticulocyte. So reticulocyte is the immature RBC. How much iron is available for the retic to be produced is what, you know, you look at the functional iron uh, level. And, you know, newer fancy uh, um, uh, parameters have come. One of them is, you know, the reticulocyte hemoglobin concentration and reticulocyte hemoglobin content which provides an indirect measure of the functional iron available for the new red cell production over just the last three, four days. Just in the last three, four days, what was the amount of iron that was being produced? And this can be helpful in certain complex cases, um, like, you know, somebody has CKD with anemia, somebody has chronic disease with anemia, you know, so some complex cases where a hematologist gets involved, because, you know, in these cases, your ferritin transferrin will not be appropriate. Because, you know, you have an underlying inflammatory disease, you have underlying CKD, you may not have the correct value of ferritin and all those things to interpret the iron deficiency and it can be confusing. And in those situations, ret hem reticulocyte hemoglobin equivalent or some cultures call it mean um, reticulocyte hemoglobin content, CHR or ret HE is the term. It gives you the functional iron in the reticulocyte iron available in the last three, four days. It is the strongest predictor in children. It is measured at the cellular level and, you know, value less than 28 indicates functional iron deficiency and a value less than 25 indicates iron deficiency anemia. So don't get upset if you don't have this parameter in your CBCs. If it is there, it is good to look at it, but it may not be there in many of the cultures that are uh, used, but I think all the other. I, I just have a request that if in your CBC practice, you are not getting RDW in your um, uh, machine, Coulter, I would say that please, it is time to upgrade RBC count, MCV, RDW are minimum requirement for a good CBC. I see many CBCs that come without a RDW. Please insist your hemat lab, 
to buy a coulter which gives an RDW value also. And if it is already there but not coming in the printout, please ask them to uh, kind of uh, uh, give the updated one. Okay. There are other new parameters like percentage hypochromic cells and low density hemoglobin low hemoglobin density percentage. So these are also some newer parameters for iron deficiency anemia, which are useful. And sometimes with all usage of all these in many complex patients, we are able to make a diagnosis. And I don't think I have got enough time to go through all these newer parameters, but I just wanted to introduce these terms to you. And the fact that they are important for patients with CKD, anemia of chronic disease, some of the cancer patients where, you know, the interpretation can be difficult for iron deficiency because of a generally high ferritin level because of the inflammatory state okay so for from the first point we learned how to interpret bedside mcv we looked at importance of rdw we looked at importance of rbc count low rbc high rbc we we saw that how thalassemia minor should be differentiated from iron deficiency we looked at the importance of menzer index so i'll take you to the next case which is a nine month old child this nine month old child has got poor feeding and fast breathing Okay, the child has severe pallor, there is hepatomegaly and there is splenomegaly. So when you see a young child with severe anemia, hepatosplenomegaly, the first thing that should come to your mind is thalassemia. It is very, very important. Okay, so you see that the uh, hemoglobin is low, the white cell count is high, the platelet is low. So lowish. So somebody would say, oh, this may be leukemia. But if you see hepatosplenomegaly in a young child, you need to evaluate this patient properly because even thalassemia can have high WBC count and I'll show you how that happens. So look at the RBC parameters as I explained to you. Now this child has microcytosis, the RDW is high. I told you in the beginning that when does RDW become high? either in nutritional anemias or something like a thalassemia major where there is a really dirty slide, a bad autoimmune hemolytic anemia where cells are all over the place and you can have high RDW. So low MCV, high RDW, low RBC count. You'll say, oh sir, this is iron deficiency anemia because same thing happens in iron deficiency, low MCV, high RDW, low RBC count. You are right in saying that. But why does the child have hepatosplenomegaly? So to confirm that, we look at the peripheral smear. When we look at the peripheral smear, we find nucleated RBCs. We find target cells. And when you see all these things, this is not seen in iron deficiency. Then you know that a lot of nucleated RBCs means that there is erythroblastosis. This is usually seen in ineffective erythropoiesis in a patient with thalassemia major. So because this child has very low hemoglobin, this is a TDT or a transfusion dependent thalassemia. You can see in this picture also, a lot of nucleated RBCs are seen. So all these nucleated RBCs, you know that, you know, the patient has got a thalassemic hemoglobinopathy. And when you do HPLC, you find that the HBF is very, very high. So I'm not going into details of this because in our subsequent classes, you learn more about thalassemias. But you, you should know that, you know, the HBF goes down with the age. And if the HBF is not going down with the age, HBF is remaining very high. That means the patient has got a thalassemia major. So this is the normal HPLC where the HBF is actually very low, less than 1%. Okay. If the child has already received blood transfusion and comes to you, you can still look at the parents and you can find if there are thalassemia minor. As I've explained to you with CVC and HPLC, you can confirm that the patient has thal major and you can also make a diagnosis using mutation analysis. Now, why was the WBC count high? The WBC count was high because the nucleated cells, WBC has a nucleus. Now, the machine doesn't know if this nucleated cell is a nucleated RBC or a nucleated WBC. So it counts all the nucleated RBCs as WBC. And that is why your WBC is spuriously high. So there are methods of how we can calculate the corrected WBC count. It is just very simple. You know, you should see that your hematologist will have to look at the peripheral smear and say, okay, I counted 100 WBC and there were 20 nucleated RBC. So based on that, you use the unitary method. So if, you, if somebody said that there are 120 WBC, out of this, you know that the WBCs are only 100 because the cell counter is counting it wrong. So that means one WBC counted by machine. That means how many WBCs? 100 by 120. And if there are 20,000 WBC, suppose the machine gives the value of 20,000, 
you know that you have to multiply 20,000 by 100 divided by 120 and you'll get the corrected WBC count. It will remove all the nucleated RBCs which has been wrongly calculated as WBC and you have the correct value with your, within your hand. Okay. Now there are formulas available and some of the fancy machines will calculate it. They will also look at nucleated RBCs and give you the value. So this is again a new parameter, nucleated RBCs. Um, and, and this is comes very handy because uh, you know somebody will already calculate it and give it to you and your life is easy and you don't have to sit and calculate how much um, nucleated uh, RBCs is to WBCs present. Now, normal newborns, term babies, preterm babies can have a lot of stress erythropoiesis. They can have a lot of nucleated RBCs and these values are available in all the charts and you can look at whether this amount of nucleated RBC present in a newborn is normal or uh, not so i'll not go into detail but again you know in some of the fancy coulters you can get this nucleated rbc uh, portion separately and you can calculate what is the amount of nucleated rbc so with this i move on to the third case you now you have looked at thalassemia major also and you know that low mcv high rdw low rbc count can be seen in thalassemia major and what is important is that you look at the peripheral smear and make a diagnosis now this is a similar case this is this child again has similar picture, but the difference is the age. This is a six year old boy who looks yellow, has poor growth, has hepatosplenomegaly. Somebody is treating him for jaundice. Okay, they are giving him medicine, treating him for jaundice. Right? This child is on Utka. Okay, the, the doctor wants to give blood transfusion and refers to you. Now you look at the CBC here. Again, the WBC is high, hemoglobin is low, platelets are lowish. You see that the MCV is low. You see that the RDW is high. You see that the RBC count is also not very high. Okay. Now in this situation, again, with the age, you have some indirect hyperbilirubinemia. Again, you look at the peripheral smear. And again, you look at so many nucleated RBCs are present. Now this is thalassemia intermedia. Okay. Because in this, because thalassemia major presents very early. Thalassemia intermedia presents late. But again, the CBC picture will be similar. Only difference will be the degree of hemoglobin. So usually thalassemia major will have very low hemoglobin by in, in fancy. Whereas thalassemia intermedia is usually picked up after two to three years of age. Okay. So very important to look at the peripheral smear, important to look at hepatosplenomegaly and not to confuse it with iron deficiency. Many such patients are treated just like iron deficiency. So how do you differentiate between thal major and NTDT? It is mainly a clinical differentiation. You have, you have said that the patient has a thalassemic hemoglobinopathy. There are nucleated RBCs. You know, there is low MCV, there is high RDW, there is, uh, you know, low RBC count. And if the hemoglobin is less than seven in such a patient, less than two years of age, it is usually a TDT. Whereas if the hemoglobin is more than seven, the age is more than two years or the hemoglobin drops less than seven after two years, this patient will have a, and we call it NTDT. And obviously the next step would be to do a heme HPLC. We do mutation analysis and give the genetic counseling to the family. So with the second and the third case, you learned that the peripheral SME and HPLC are key, are key to make a diagnosis of TDT. But CBC is a very good parameter to kind of suspect this. You know how to now calculate corrected WBC count. And please remember, because there is ineffective erythropoiesis, even if TDT and NTDT are hemolytic anemias, your retic count is actually not raised in these situations. I'll move on to the next case, which is just I've put something for interest because this is a two-year-old child who has wheezing for the last few months and is diagnosed with iron deficiency and is on iron for the last six to eight months. Patient presents with severe breathing difficulty and you can see some haziness in the x-ray. Now, if you look at the CBC, the patient says hemoglobin is low, platelet is high. Now, in iron deficiency, what happens? Little bit thrombocytosis can happen. Why does this happen? Because erythropoietin is similar to uh, thrombopoietin. When you have severe anemia, your erythropoietin will be high and this erythropoietin will also lead to a little bit of thrombocytosis. If you look at parameters, low MCV, High RDW, low RBC count, count, typical, typical of this is iron deficiency, we keep treating. 
but see iron deficiency doesn't mean it is can be only iron deficiency it can be some other problem also now in this particular child who has recurrent wheezing who has bad iron deficiency despite being on treatment for the last 6 to 8 months this child is on iron why is the hemoglobin still very low so that thought made us thought that okay may, there may be another condition and because of the lung problem that was going on and on we did a ct we found hemorrhages in the scan and this child actually had a idiopathic pulmonary hemosiderosis. The child kept on bleeding into the lungs. And after giving steroids, the child completely became better. And the iron deficiency also improved. So, you know, CBCs will tell you what is the problem. But the etiology needs to be evaluated from case to case. The microcytic picture that we talked about can be seen in lead poisoning, hookworm infestation. Celiac disease is a very important cause in North. It can be inflammatory bowel disease, which first presents at iron deficiency anemia. Intestinal polyps and patient losing blood with that presenting as iron deficiency anemia. So iron deficiency anemia is just one thing. There can be many causes. Now, similar way, when you talk about microcytic hypochromic picture, so this is a two-year-old boy who's receiving recurrent blood transfusions and has got a developmental delay. Now, in this child, again, the MCV was low and the RDW was high. You'll think, oh my God, this is iron deficiency. But why would iron deficiency require blood again and again? That should make us think that there may be something else going on. And when we evaluated the parameters, the parameters were not fitting into iron deficiency. The serum iron was high, the transferrin saturation was high, the ferritin was high, and HPLC of the parents were normal. They, did, they were not thalassemia minor. Child had been given iron many times. So this is not iron deficiency. And that is at that point of time, we need to evaluate these patients further. Like in this particular case, we did the bone marrow and found ring sideroblast. And the diagnosis was uh, sideroblastic anemia. So there are some variants which are responsive to pyridoxine and this child was given pyridoxine and there was a very good improvement in the developmental delay and the child now does not require blood transfusion. So I'll show you another case again, you know, highlighting what the CBC can tell you. The CBC in this case, this is an online consult, child has recurrent anemia, child looks mildly yellowish and child has received one blood transfusion. Okay, now in this case, if you see the MCV is low, 71. RDW is high, 24. Okay, the RBC count here is 3.3. You'll again think, oh, this is iron deficiency anemia, you know, similar kind of picture. But in this child, again, the peripheral smear shows some target cell, tear drop cells, elliptocytes, basophilic stippling, few fragmented red cells are seen. So that means there is something going on more in this particular patient. And why is this child mildly yellow? Now, when we did the retic count, Look at the retic count. This is how, you know, we get the retic count in our hospital. We get retic count, we get corrected retic count, we get absolute retic number, we get immature retic fraction, and we get ret HE. You know, ret HE, I told, told was, again, one sensitive marker for iron deficiency. But in this particular case, you see the retic count is very high. Why should retic count be very high in cases of uh, um, uh, just a pure iron deficiency? Because this was an online consult, the examination was not done. We asked for HPLC and we found alpha thalassemia in this patient. The HBA2 was very, very low. So this is hemoglobin parts. This child had alpha thalassemia. So again, microcytic hypochromic anemia, if you are seeing in CBC, not everything is iron deficiency. Please look at the picture in the whole total. Look at whether the patient has received iron therapy, responded or not responded. What is the HBA2? What is the HPLC? And you know, all these pictures may be required unless the patient has a very classical iron deficiency, low ferritin, poor diet, in which case you don't need to evaluate this patient further. Alpha thalassemia can present as microcytic anemia and one of the difficult microcytic anemia, which is not getting better, you know, you need to think of celiac disease, alpha thalassemia, blood loss, intestinal polyp, inflammatory bubble disease, and all these conditions should come to your mind if a patient does not respond to a usual iron deficiency. So this is the first spectrum of disorders that I wanted to show to you with the help of uh, CBC is how you look at each and every parameter and kind of come to a diagnosis. So we now move gears and go to the other spectrum in the remaining half of our presentation. Okay, so here we talk about a 14 year old girl which presents with lethargy, poor appetite. The child is pale and has got mild jaundice. Now again, you know, teenage girls 
are one of that category where the diet can be a big issue. And in this particular patient also, the diet was not good. The abdomen is soft. There is no hepatosplenomegaly in this patient. Now, when you look at the CVC here, you see that the child has anemia. There is mild, you know, towards the lower side WBC count. There is thrombocytopenia. So in fact, you know, it looks more like towards like going towards bicytopenia or pancytopenia. But here the MCV is high. Now I told you bedside calculation, but here in this case, classically, it is very high. Bedside calculation was 84 plus 0.6 times of the age. Now you don't need that here. It is 123 here. It is classic macrocytic anemia. Don't call it megaloblastic because megaloblastic is a term given to bone marrow picture, not the peripheral smear. So you have a micro, macrocytic anemia. You have low RBC count. You have high RDW. Now this again points, I told you high RDW means low, high MCV, high RDW means again, nutritional anemia should come first to your mind and the RBC count is very low. So this child was suspected to have megaloblastic. What would be the next steps? You can do a B12 folic acid level if you have the facilities, otherwise a trial can be given, a peripheral smear should be looked at and you might find an, um, uh, hyper segmented neutrophils, you will find macrocytic uh, cells and you may find some basophilic stippling, how will jolly body, cabot rings. And if you find any of these typical features and you may have knuckle pigmentation, you may have a diet which would be very bad and this will point towards a macrocytic anemia and in the megaloblastic anemia and you can even avoid doing a bone marrow and give them a trial of B12. But in this particular case, the bone marrow was done and confirmed a megaloblastic anemia. So please remember that you can have macrocytic anemia with a megaloblastic marrow or a non-megaloblastic marrow. The megaloblastic marrow will have B12 deficiency, folic acid deficiency as the main important thing. But you can also have macrocytic anemia and aplastic anemia, inherited bone marrow failure syndromes, diamond back fan anemia, hypothyroidism, and you know, some of these rare disorders or say bone marrow infiltration, and you may have a little bit of macrocytosis there. So I'll take you to a next case, which is a four and a half year old girl who has got fever, abdominal pain and yellowish discoloration of eyes. So we'll now look at some other RBC parameters also. Now, in this case, the previous history, there was some history of anemia and jaundice and there was neonatal jaundice as well. So you are dealing with a girl who has Anemia, jaundice, neonatal jaundice, and previous history of being evaluated for jaundice. So this child has got pallor, splenomegaly, and hepatomegaly. Now this child comes to you, you are a pediatrician, you are in your clinic, and the child has got fever, abdominal pain, and jaundice. When such a child comes to you, you are right in thinking of acute viral hepatitis, you are right in thinking of malaria. These would be your first diagnosed DDs when you see a splenomegaly. Um, just because we, it is a hematology class, you know, we are thinking more of hematology. But when you see such a patient with fever, jaundice, you will think of viral hepatitis, malaria. Now, in this particular patient, the mother also shows you some previous CBCs. Now, what is typical here? You see that there is anemia in both these CBC, 2019, 2020. Okay, you can see that the RBC count is low in both the cases. There is some previous history of jaundice also. Now, a typical thing, you know, MCV is lowish to okayish, not too bad. You see that there is some indirect hyperbilirubinemia here. The SGPT was normal previously, but this is an acute episode, so we don't know. But a typical thing to observe here, and I'll bring your attention to that, is MCHC. Now, if your MCHC is higher than 35, and you are dealing with a child with anemia, splenomegaly, recurrent jaundice, or recurrent anemia, please keep hereditary spherocytosis in your mind. And at that point of time, a consult was given to us for anemia. And what we did was, you know, just did a magic, came and asked the family history and father said, yeah, yeah I also have, uh, somebody told me that my spleen is enlarged or, you know, he may just say that I had a gallstone surgery very early in life. And you know, you know that this is a typical case of hereditary spherocytosis. The spherocytes are round and dense and um, hyperchromic. They do not have central pallor. They may have a reduced mean cell diameter. 
but because the retics becomes very very high you see in this case the retics are very high and retics are generally large your mcv may come as very high in cases of hereditary spherocytosis because the retics are being picked up um, uh, for the mcv the, otherwise the spherocytes are not really very large so spherocytes can be seen in many many conditions but mchc is important mcv is important Uh, retic count is very important and these will help you to kind of make a diagnosis and obviously a good history and a peripheral smear is important and on incubated osmotic fragility or uh, you know in gangaram hospital we regularly do uh, um, ema dye binding test along with incubated osmotic fragility and we are able to clinch the diagnosis of uh, hereditary spherocytosis in most of our patients you will need to differentiate intravascular and extravascular hemolysis and i'll not go into the details of that but hereditary spherocytosis is a typical case of extravascular hemolysis in the cbc in a child who comes with severe anemia sometimes you'll see these bite cells which are typical of g6pd and if you see thrombocytopenia with sudden onset anemia with renal dysfunction and you see all these broken cells you know you may be dealing with a patient with hus which will be you know more going towards a intravascular hemolysis okay so you know while we are talking of other rbc parameters and we talked about um, we have talked about mcv rbc count rdw uh, mchc again can point to some things now look at this particular case this is very interesting these are all real life cases look at this cbc you know i get a call from a friend uh, are yaar what is happening to this patient i i'm totally shocked this is the cbc please look at the cbc the hemoglobin is 24.6 the rbc count looks okay wbc is little higher the pcv is 33 so what is the rule of 3 you know hemoglobin multiplied by 3 should be the pcv but the pcv here is normal look at the mcv mch but you look at mchc it is over over means they are not able to measure what the mchc is now this can typically be seen in interference when there is interference in the cool term so this patient had a very lipemic serum and if you have severe lipemia your hemoglobin estimation becomes incorrect so if you see such a picture you know go back and check this patient why does this happen you know we'll come to the basics again now so the hematocrit is what is hematocrit the hematocrit is the density you know the dense rbcs that you are seeing it is measured by one one rbc and the mean rbc a uh, volume so the mean mcv is the volume of one rbc and all the rbc so you multiply it you'll get the packed cell volume okay you get the hematocrit now that is normal in this patient and mcv rbc and hematocrit is not affected by any uh, you know abnormality like lipemia whereas when you have interference and you have too much of you know you are not able to interpret your hemoglobin properly if this hemoglobin becomes high but the hematocrit remains normal your mchc will also become high because these are calculated values you know the coulter is calculating by an algorithm so you see in this particular patient your hemoglobin is wrong your mchc is wrong all the other parameters are normal now when we saw this patient the patient serum was lipemic the hba1c was 16 the rbs was very high so this child had a lot of metabolic syndrome like problem now the proper turbidometry uh, you know the turbidometry method led to a wrong report and unrecordable mchc whereas the real mc hemoglobin was 7 in such cases you have to remove the plasma mix it with an equal volume of saline and you'll get the correct so cbc can be misleading but if you interpret it properly you will actually make a correct diagnosis okay so this is a very good example i'll show you a very interesting uh, next example here you know you will not see this commonly but when you see this and you make a diagnosis you will feel really happy that you know you have diagnosed all these rare conditions by looking at cbc now look at this cbc this is very important see the note of the doctor the doctor says kuch gadbad hai kindly recheck aapka report galat hai that is what the doctor is saying here can you see the note so the hemoglobin is 12 the pack cell volume is 21 now by the rule of 3 12 times 3 should be high but it is only 21 look at the rbc count it is 2.3 now 2.3 multiplied by 3 should give you hemoglobin i told you rule of 
RBC count times 3 is hemoglobin, hemoglobin times 3 is hematocrit. But here nothing is being followed. Neither the RBC nor the PCV are following the trend with the hemoglobin. Now look at MCV is 91. The MCHC here is 55, very, very high. This is not hereditary spherocytosis. This is some other problem happening here. Again, you know, based on those calculations, and I'll show you that. Now the doctor got it repeated. Now in the repeat, you see MCHC 61. Now he's again wondering, oh my God, what is happening? Why the MCHC is so high? Why is this happening? Now, somebody heated this sample and after heating the sample, the RBC clumping became separate. And you see here, the final RBC was, hemoglobin was 12.5. The TLC is okay. You got the correct PCV value. You got the correct MCHC value. Why was all this happening? Because there was agglutination. The RBCs were all getting clumped. And these clumped RBCs in the coulter were causing problem and the mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration was coming to be very, very high because again, these are calculated values and you get all this problem when such a thing happens. You look at the smear, you go back and check. Your RBC count is spuriously low because all these cells are clumped together. So you, you actually have a good RBC count, but the RBC count is actually coming very low. Okay, so, you know, these were some of the interesting things I thought I should show you and share with you when we are talking about CBCs. Now, I'll just briefly tell you retic count because retic is something that hematologists are obsessed about. What is retic? Retics are immature red cells. They are the young RBCs that come out because if there is too much of destruction or too much of blood loss, then the body tries to produce high amount of retic. The normal retic count in a patient is around uh, 0.5 to 2% and the younger children will have high retic. The retics are young, they have got large uh, high MCV and they, are, they need supravital staining. They need a special stain to, and they appear these blue in color when we look at the retic count. So it is very, very important that you correct the retic count if you have anemia. So the corrected retic count is calculated by retic multiplied by hematocrit divided by expected hematocrit. So suppose a six-month-old child is there and the hemoglobin is three and the retic count is 1%. Now I told you the normal retic count is 0.5 to 2. So you will say, oh, this retic count is okay. But this retic count is not okay because for this degree of anemia, the bone marrow should actually be producing too many retics. If the bone marrow is not able to produce that many retics, it tells you that your bone marrow is not functioning. How do I know that? Sir, this value is normal. How do I know whether what is the correct Calculate the corrected retic count. So this patient's hematocrit is 10. The expected hematocrit, say if the hemoglobin is supposed should be 12, then the hematocrit should be 36. 12 times 3 is 36. And if you put it in the formula, the corrected retic count is 0.28%, which is much less than 0.5. So you know that the corrected retic count in this percent is, patient is very low. That means this bone marrow is failing, is not able to produce enough retic count. There's also something called as a retic production index. But for the interest of the time, I'm going to skip it. It is available in Nelson and you can go back and look at it. Okay. Now there are newer parameters like immature retic fraction. They come in the newer counters, what is called as IRF. And IRF represents the proportion of young retics with the highest RNA content. So out of these retics also, there are immature retics. And suppose you have done a bone marrow transplant or something like, you know, a newer uh, uh, chemotherapy has been given. And if the bone marrow starts producing this good amount of immature retics, you know that the bone marrow is recovering. And it's a new fancy parameter often used by hematologists and not really, you know, sometimes you give B12 folic acid and you want to see whether the patient is responding or not. This immature retic fraction will be the early to actually respond. So while we are talking about retic, I'll show you a case example. So this is a six-month-old baby who's got market pallor. Mother's nutrition is okay. Uh, this child was completely well until a few weeks prior. The child has market pallor, no lymph node, no organomegaly. And this is the baby's photograph. And the baby has got digital abnormality. So in a young baby who's got severe anemia, market pallor, when you do the investigations, you find that the hemoglobin is low you find that there is a little bit of macrocytosis. The RBC count was very, very low. 
Now, in this case, again, the retic is 1%. So please note that the corrected retic count is very, very low. In a young child, if you see this very low retic count, low RBC count, and the maternal nutrition was kind of okay, you know, why should this child have iron deficiency, anemia, or B12 deficiency? You know, if the mother is breastfeeding, mother's nutrition wasn't okay, this should not happen. And in such a patient, you know, we can diagnose based on this retic count, we do a bone marrow and we identified that the RBC precursor are not there. And the diagnosis here is diamond black fan anemia or pure red cell aplasia. So a very low retic count in a young child who requires transfusion, think of uh, DBA. Now, again, similar case. This is a 12-year-old child who is being evaluated for short stature. Look at the CBC. There is a progressive decline in CBC. Now, this child is again and again being given B12, folic acid, iron, def iron deficiency. All the time, people are treating him for that. Look at MCV. If you have given B12 folic acid, why this macrocytosis should still persist? There is something wrong with this child. The child is being evaluated for short stature. There is macrocytosis. Now, if you look at the platelet count, the platelet is also towards the lowish side. The neutrophils are also going down. The white cell count in this patient is again going down. So eventually this patient is developing a pancytopenia. There is macrocytosis. There has been good treatment with B12 folic acid. That means this child has got some other disease and macrocytosis can be seen in patients with DBA, it can be seen in patients with Fanconi anemia. And this patient most likely has a Fanconi anemia. And when we do the chromosomal breakage analysis, you can actually find that. So please remember that just looking carefully at CBCs, serial CBCs, writing them in your investigation chart, you are able to make a diagnosis. So macrocytic anemia can be many, many conditions. And in fact, if you develop, start developing cytopenias in a Fanconi patient, you may be actually progressing towards a aplastic anemia, or you may be progressing towards a myelodysplastic syndrome. So just last few minutes, I'm going to focus on WBC and platelets. So, you know, the major chunk of CBC is actually anemias. WBC platelet, I'll just try to quickly finish that because that is also a very important part of your CBC. So we know neutrophil, eosinophil, basophil, lymphocyte, monocyte are the important cells and you should be able to identify them. This picture gives it beautifully. So eight-year-old male child who presents with poor appetite, lethargy, low-grade fever for 12 days. Most of these children are being treated as typhoid. Antibiotics are being given in, pumped in. You know, we rely too much on uh, Vidal tests. We don't do blood cultures. And that is a problem in our country. Now, this child is directed to have clinical anemia and was started iron one month back. This is the CBC. So you'll, when you look at the CBC, you know, you look at WBC, you look at the platelet, you look at hemoglobin, you know, many people just every low hemoglobin start giving iron or B12 and that is unfortunate because we need to go into the detail. The MCV is not very low here. Okay, it's kind of normocytic. I'm worried about normocytic anemias because normocytic anemias can be usually can be dangerous. Big problems come whenever we talk about normocytic anemias, okay? Now, you want to make an impression based on the CBC, but please do not give an impression unless you have looked at the DLC. You know, when you look at, my, my brain is always tuned to look at hemoglobin, TLC, platelet count, then I look at ANC, and then I move forward. Because I'm a hematologist, I see all the dreaded diseases. So, you know, I, I, my brain goes this way. And then I look at RBC indices, I look at DLC in detail. So it is very important that you look at differential leukocyte count. And if you have neutropenia, please, this child requires your extra attention. This child may require serial CBCs. And this is what happens, you know, this child who's just being treated with antibiotics and all actually has a leukemia. You can see these blasts. So please remember that ANC is a very important marker of a serious illness. I do agree that with viral illnesses, with many illnesses, sometimes the ANC goes down, but please document that the ANC rises with time. Absence of blast does not rule out leukemia. Sometimes you may just have a cytopenia 
and the marrow is packed with blast, but the blast have still not come out in periphery. The skill is to pick leukemia at that stage. You know, when there are obvious blasts, it's not a big deal. Now, this girl, you know, who has facial palsy, this is a real case. This is a real case. This girl has facial palsy. Somebody has treated her with steroids for uh, Bell's palsy. But you see the CBC, five-year-old girl treated as Bell's palsy, had mild headache, had facial de deviation. But if somebody had paid attention to this child's CBC, you would see that there is neutropenia. There is only 20% neutrophil. Okay, what is the business of a Bell's palsy to affect your CBC? The platelet in this case was lowish. Why do we ignore this when a child has got a neurological problem? The child has anemia. Why should every child anemia be treated as iron deficiency? You know, this child's MCV was not even low. So we missed the boat in this patient, gave steroids to a child who actually had a CNS leukemia. The child had CNS leukemia, you gave steroids, the leukemia got better and you thought, oh, I've done magic for a patient with Bell's palsy. So CBC is very, very important. So this is the full-blown CBC of this child. When she came to us at Gangaram Hospital, you know, the platelet was 5,000. They were already blasts in the peripheral smear. No big deal of making a diagnosis of leukemia. In this case, ALL carries 80% success rate. But if we mistreat them, obviously the success rate will go down. Now, while we are talking of neutropenia, now this is a very interesting case. This child came to me from Kashmir. Two-year-old girl presents with fever, gum swelling, redness of the mouth, uh, of mouth to a local doctor. Fever lasted for six days. She saw a couple of doctors, finally was diagnosed with Kawasaki. She have found high ESR, high CRP. She was given steroids, IVIG. One unit of blood was given. Why? Because everybody in India has iron deficiency. She was admitted for four to five days. She improved. After that, she had complaints of constipation, tummy pain, recurrent in, uh, 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 injections were required. And in January 2022, when we saw this child, we just sat with all the CBCs and plotted. Nobody had paid attention to this severe degree of neutropenia that this child was having throughout. Please, please, please don't miss neutropenia in a patient. If you find neutropenia, this child requires evaluation. This child's diagnosis was a congenital neutropenia. The child was getting repeated infections. The whole oral cavity problem fever was related to neutropenia. And after giving GCSF, you can see that this is again another CBC from this very ch child who came to us from Kashmir. Again, there was severe neutropenia. And with regular GCSF, the child is totally doing well. And if you're a non-responder, you need a transplant. This is another girl whom I picked, uh, you know, with recurrent infections, recurrent oral gingivitis, had a Elaine mutation and a congenital neutropenia. And after giving GCSF, there was a dramatic improvement in this child. Sometimes you see shift to left. Somebody will say that the CBC has shift to left. What is that? It means that immature cells are coming out. Persistent inflammation can lead to this, but always you need to be very sure whether they are just some immature cells or there are blasts present in that. Band forms and all you are very familiar of. Sometimes the WBC will show very high WBC. You know, if they are all mature neutrophils, we call it a leukemoid reaction. If there are a lot of immature cells, we need to, you know, kind of evaluate whether the child has a leukemia or not. So, you know, just a high WBC or just a low WBC does not make much sense. You need to look at the differential. An expert needs to look at that and then you can make a correct diagnosis. Another important thing is leukocyte alkaline phosphatase. So the mature neutrophils produce a high amount of lab. So when you have a leukemoid reaction, your lap will be high, whereas you, you will not see, you will see a low lap when you have a lot of immature cells or malignancies like CML. So again, a WBC or CBC will help you to find this. Now, this is a five month old baby who presents with this. And, you know, there are multiple skin lesions, you know, I'm just going towards the WBC area and trying to finish this talk uh, in the next five minutes. You see that this child has hemoglobin, which is 9.3. You see that the WBC is 4.2. The neutrophils are 79 and the lymphocytes are 12%. This child has got multiple skin lesions. Look at this baby. This is a young baby with such a severe infection on the skin. Now, can, can CBC help you to make a diagnosis? Young babies usually have lymphocytes. But in this baby, the lymphocytes are low. I told you in the first slide, 
in the first two slides, I showed you that with age, the CBC changes, and I showed you lymphocytosis in normal children. Here in this particular case, who's got so much lesions on the skin, it looks like something drastic is happening to the child. There is actually lymphopenia. So suspect that this child may have a serious problem if there is serious lymphopenia. Now, Nelson gives us these ranges for what are the normal lymphocyte count at age, and you can take a picture. It is available in Nelson, so you can refer to that. And when we evaluated this patient in detail, we found that the child had skid, severe combined immunodeficiency. And you know, just by looking at the lymphopenia, we had something going on in our mind. If a young child presents with very high WBC count, very high neutrophils, we'll think, oh, maybe this child has a leukocyte adhesion defect. Because in that case, neutrophilia will be there. If you see lymphopenia in a child who is seriously ill, think of skid. So again, just a simple, humble CBC can tell you so many things about making a diagnosis. Now, this is a five-year-old child who presents with fever of few days durations with neck nodes. There is one echemotic spot below the knee. Now, look at this child's CBC, okay? The hemoglobin is 9, the, uh, the WBC is 18.2, the neutrophils are 26%, the platelet are 1.3. Now, in this particular child, Again, there was lymphocytosis, 68% lymphos were present. This is a five-year-old child. So many lymphos are not normal. So the lymphocyte high being also can tell you something. There are neck nodes present. Okay, now what, what are we thinking? When we looked at the smear, we found these, uh, uh, you know, these typical lymphocytes, which are the atypical lymphocytes of infectious mononucleosis. And we could say that, okay, this child has an EBV-related disease. So when we say lymphocytosis, also there are certain sets of disease. I just recently had a patient who was referred to me as leukemia. But when we looked at this child, this child was coughing very badly. And at that point of time, we evaluated this child for pertussis and the diagnosis was pertussis. And there was lymphocytosis in the peripheral smear, which the doctor outside thought maybe they are blasts. So again, you know, CBC... Looking at the child, looking at the smear, you are able to make a diagnosis. So lymphocytosis is also important, just like lymphopenia is very important, or leukocytosis or neutrophilia. Now, just the last part, which is the platelet. Now, platelet, we need to look at the number, we need to look at the size. One platelet per oil field means, you see, the platelet is minimum 10,000. Okay. Now, this case is a four-year-old girl who has got petechiae bruises epistaxis. Hemoglobin was 8, 70% of our Indian have um, iron deficiency anemia, iron deficiency anemia, hoga. platelet was low. You saw some giant platelet. Oh, this is ITP. Give this child steroids. That is what happened. This child was treated as ITP because somebody saw giant platelet. Okay, on the MPV, MPV was high. Now, you give steroids, bleeding stops. But what happens later? Three weeks later, this child comes with the WBC count of one lakh. That means this child was never a ITP. This child had leukemia. Sometimes things can be confusing. You know, we have not looked, we have looked at TLC, but we have not looked at neutrophil. We have not looked at peripheral smear. You cannot treat a patient with ITP without looking at the peripheral smear. So just small, small parameters of CBC don't rely. Rely at the whole picture of the patient. Okay. Now this child had a leukemia. Don't give steroids in undiagnosed condition. Always look at neutrophil and peripheral smear when you are ta talking about ITP. Now this child, look at this child. This is an eight-month-old child who has received I IV antibiotics for a lower respiratory tract infection. Okay? Now this child com comes, comes to you with thrombocytopenia. Again, ITP hoga. Everybody thinks only thrombocytopenia means oh, there is some past history of infection. That means there is ITP now. But again, if you carefully look at every patient and every CBC, normally ITP is triggered by upper respiratory tract infection. But this is an eight-month-old child, young child. This child has pneumonia. This child now has thrombocytopenia. So ITP, you know, in a very young child who, is, who has had a lower respiratory or a bad infection, please think that there might be something else. So just a humble CBC. There is a parameter, mean platelet volume. In this child, the mean platelet volume is low. 
but everybody ignored that they thought this is itp treated this child as itp gave ivig gave steroids there was gi bleeding platelet was marginally better but the child was not getting totally better then the child was referred to us what we did stripped the baby examined there was eczema on the skin and we went back looked at the mpv the mpv was low so you know that the diagnosis of this child is viscot aldrich syndrome there is a new parameter immature platelet fracture so when you are having a lot of destruction of in the bone marrow or outside a lot of destruction of platelets outside your immature platelet will be high this is a very good parameter for itp for dengue children who are recovering and once your itp starts getting better your ipf starts going down so again a very useful parameter new parameter which is helpful in many patients i'll skip this because of the uh, lack of time um, and you know just wind it up with the last one or two cases about platelet uh, so this is a 11 year old girl who presents with menorrhagia there is a history of recurrent epistaxis dental bleeds again there is thrombocytopenia being treated as itp now you see that the platelet count is very not very low the platelet count is kind of okay the mean platelet is high i agree but with the 90000 platelet why is this patient bleeding again and again that should not happen you will bleed a lot only if the platelet is really really low the ps did show giant platelets all giant platelets are not itp now in this particular case where a girl is presenting with this history we saw giant platelets but the platelets were not very low what we we found that there was a history of being treated like itp the bleeding time was really really prolonged and what we did was we did platelet function analysis and this child's diagnosis was a bernard solier syndrome the correct method to do is ivs method and i'm sure when you talk about bleeding disorders you'll find that so when you are looking at platelet number platelet size in your cbc again to look at the whole platelet picture is important and with doing a, a platelet aggregation study you can find this and finally thrombocytosis is also important because sometimes you can have iron deficiency anemia kawasaki disease and many other diseases where you know you can or reactive thrombocytosis where you know just with looking at the platelet count you know we have looked at patients with lung abscess with thrombocytosis so we found thrombocytosis in a child who was not doing very well had cough and you know we thought maybe there is a some kind of an infection sitting which is driving that platelet count being high and sometimes these small small parameters can actually help you make a correct diagnosis so this is a child who presents with pancytopenia again very important when you see pancytopenia you see macrocytosis you see high rdw you'll think whether it is b12 deficiency or whether it is folic acid deficiency but pancytopenia needs thorough evaluation when you see pancytopenia if it is not b12 folic acid you need to do a bone marrow aspiration and biopsy because you can have leukemia you can have aplastic anemia you can have hlh and based on your biopsy you you may either see completely flat out marrow you may see find a a chromosomal breakage positive in these patients leading to a diagnosis of fanconi you may find hlh or you may find blast making a diagnosis of leukemia so pancytopenia again the initial case that i showed was mainly for b12 folic acid but again pancytopenia can be many many conditions and a thorough evaluation is needed so hemogram deceptively it's a simple test to order and interpret it is very expensive it is often treated as a routine test uh, but an astute clinician may use the nuances and clues from the cbc to guide further investigation and make a correct diagnosis so we looked at many many things today and um, i hope that this uh, session uh, was hopeful to you and through the spectrum of all these diseases you know i took you through each and every cbc in all these conditions and try to explain to you that how one cbc can help you make a diagnosis of a difficult condition so so thank you again um, uh, from me and from my hospital sir gangaram hospital um, and uh, you know i am happy to help you any time if you have a a uh, hematology related problem and thanks again to the organizers for giving me this opportunity thank you dr manas for a wonderful presentation uh, there are few queries in the question answer box uh, though some have been answered uh, uh, why leukemia reaction are more symptomatic and poor outcome and difficult to treat although at the same number of count leukemia is less symptomatic 
and be able to manage and save the child. So, um, you know, uh, leukemoid reaction, um, your white cell count becoming very high may indicate a severe sepsis. Okay. Um, uh, leukemia ALL usually responds beautifully to treatment. And some of the multi-drug resistant bacteria or bad sepsis may not have a good response. So while we are able to cure 80, 85% of children with cancer, some of the very, very bad sepsis that come to us in India may not be cured. So, uh, you know, we can't really say that leukemoid reaction is bad. I can only say that the infection is bad, which is leading to the leukemoid reaction. Okay. Uh, Dr. Manish, uh, you want to ask something? Please unmute yourself. Dr. Manish? No, thank you. Achha, you had raised your hand. Oh, it was raised by mistake. Okay. There were many questions being raised, uh, I think, during those, but I'm happy that, you know, many have been answered, I think. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, 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 all the questions also. Those who have been answered. Yes, uh, excellent presentation. Yeah, uh, but uh, I just wanted uh, to tell that uh, you had uh, spent quite some time on uh, RBCs. I think RBCs and WBC, they should be uh, put in separate. Uh, discussions so you had to rush to the wbc and uh, it, it was a really nice presentation thank you thank you actually the thank thing you, is sir. that you know it is uh, wbc interpretation is relatively simpler uh, and rbc interpretation is very complex uh, most of the anemias we are actually you know that that a pediatrician deals with is, you know, mainly him, uh, RBC related disorders. So I wanted to spend a lot of time on iron deficiency, thalassemias, uh, macrocytic anemia, megaloblastic anemia. Whereas when WBC problems or platelet problems starts, it usually the uh, the burden goes on to the hematologist. Whereas you know most of the RBC problems can be sorted at your level. Thank you, Dr. Manish. Dr. Sunita, Dr. Manchanda. Hello, uh, good morning. Nothing uh, much, so just to say that it is an excellent beginning. Very nice presentation as always. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Manchanda. Any other queries by any other panelists? Uh, delegates? Uh, Dr. Benita has asked, sir, sometimes patients with anemia come after one blood transfusion. How does that change the CBC? So, you know, when a patient comes to you after blood transfusion, interpreting things becomes very difficult. So I always encourage that if you are suspecting a hemolytic anemia, please send a sample for HPLC before giving blood transfusion. Always before giving blood transfusion, a peripheral smear should be done. A CBC should be sent for a anemia profile, which includes ferritin and all the other parameters. Uh, it is very difficult for a hematologist to make a correct diagnosis. We have got genetic ways. We have got many other ways. Or the best way is to sometimes sit, sit tight, let the effect of the outside blood go away, and then you can in, uh, evaluate. If the problem is very much ongoing, say an autoimmune hemolytic anemia who has received a blood transfusion, whatever blood has been given will be destroyed. So, you know, again, you'll be able to evaluate. So it, be, it depends on the clinical scenario. But if it is a benign disease and the patient is very stable, we wait for the effect of that blood to go and then evaluate the patient. So maybe after 8 to 12 weeks? Uh, yes, sir. Yes. Again, it depends on the severity of the condition. If the blood was not very good volume or if the, uh, if the severity of the disease is very severe, you know, the child may present within four weeks with a hemoglobin of, say, six or five, and then you can evaluate the patient. So the, uh, Dr. Gigi has asked why reticulocyte count is not raised in thalassemia. 
So because there is ineffective erythropoiesis, most of the retics get destroyed within the marrow. Um, uh, you know, whereas in patients like uh, hereditary spherocytosis, the red cells are being destroyed in the spleen. So, you know, they come out in the picture, then get destroyed. Red ticks are being produced, whereas in thalassemia, because of ineffective erythropoiesis, the red ticks are also destroyed. Uh, Dr. Sandeh has asked, cost of platelet aggregation studies. So it is expensive. It is expensive okay. in our hospital. I think it is definitely more than okay. 10, 15,000. And it yeah. is a tricky test. I must tell you, the parents get very frustrated at times because our lab demands a control sample as well to do a platelet aggregation study. So we need to get a person who is not related to the patient, who is not on aspirin or other drugs, who doesn't have a bleeding history. We need to have that control sample. We give an appointment. We do it just by the book. It can be annoying for the patient, but to get a correct interpretation, we have to follow all these steps. Uh, please explain the rule of three again, Dr. Pradeep has asked. So rule of, rule of three means your RBC count multiplied by three should give you hemoglobin. Hemoglobin multiplied by three should give you hematocrit. So if suppose you have a RBC of say 2 million, your expected hemoglobin is six. If you have a six hemoglobin, your expected hemoglobin is a hematocrit is 18. Any discrepancy, as I explained to you, will point you towards a particular disease. Tell about lipemic serum and cryoglobulin surrogate. So lipemic serum interferes with the Coulter estimation. Your hemoglobin is interpreted wrongly because of lipemia and the hemoglobin comes high. Because MCHC is a calculated parameter which uses hemoglobin value, MCHC also becomes wrong. So what you need to do is separate the plasma, take the uh, remaining blood, add equal amount of normal saline, and then run this sample into the coulter, you will get the correct hemoglobin, correct MCS. <clears throat> and uh, one more thing, uh, if we uh, should not be doing HPLC in thalassemia minor without correcting the anemia, but we do H uh, HPLC in uh, thalassemia major. Yes, that is right. Because <clears throat> in thalassemia major, there is no hemoglobin, normal hemoglobin formation. So HBA is not formed. All that is being formed is HBF. You need to make the diagnosis by HBF value. Your HBF will be very high. You can make a diagnosis of thalassemia major. Now in thalassemia minor, what you need is that HBA2. Now the cutoff is 3.5. So sometimes when you have iron deficiency, you may be 3.2. You correct the iron deficiency, it will become 3.5. So the value change is very less. So to get that correct value, ideally it should be done after correction of iron deficiency. Uh, Dr. Siaram, you want to ask something? Uh, can I you can write, see Jagdish please? Chandra sir also. Jagdish Chandra sir, if sir wants to comment anything or if he wants to give any answer, you know, uh, please sir, please unmute yourself. No, I think uh, uh, actually I joined. Uh, uh, I thought after uh, five, seven minutes I will log out, but you kept me bound. So I <laughs> spent a good 75 minutes listening to you as uh, ever you do good talk. And uh, I think the all the queries uh, uh, that are being discussed, they have been answered very nicely and you, it was a great presentation. So nothing to add. Just uh, uh, a small thing like whenever we see DLC, you highlighted that neutropenia is there, you know. But uh, at times, a, a newer pathologist would write relative lymphocytosis. So you get diverted to that. I mean, 7% or 10% of the 4,000, let us say, TLC, say it's 10% neutrophil and 90% lymphocytes. So the fellow would write relative lymphocytosis. But here we are dealing with 400 neutrophils. So we have to look at our own, own calculation, not going by what the pathologist has really written. Absolutely, sir. So, yes, uh, others, I think, uh, once more compliments to you for a nice talk. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Kesavalu, you want to ask something? Sorry. 
Dr. Kleanesur? I think most of the queries have been answered, but if there are any remaining, you can still post to us and we'll be happy to answer. And once again, we thank all the delegates for attending this session. And we are really thankful to all the faculties who made this uh, uh, program possible. And uh, with such a nice beginning, Dr. Manus Kalra, I must compliment you and uh, thank you. So any other uh, faculties want to say something? We have uh, Dr. Kamal Ji, Dr. Lalan Bharti, Dr. Puneet Sahi. So any other comments? Sir, uh, excellent presentation. Uh, it's a pleasure to listen to Dr. Manas Kalra and we never want to miss it. And every time we learn new things from him, that's uh, that's all I want to say. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kamal Ji. Thank you. Dr. Puneet? Yes, uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, yeah, it's just a repetition of what uh, Jagdish sir and uh, Kamal Ji ma'am have uh, reiterated. It was a lovely presentation. You actually had us hooked throughout. I had a couple of things to learn from you, sir. So an excellent uh -huh. talk. Excellent talk. Thank so, you. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. So with this, uh, we'd like to close the session and see everyone next week. Dr. Lin, you want to say some, something? Yeah, yeah. It was excellent presentation. I would like to congratulate you and Bipul uh, for uh, initiating this program and conceptualizing this program under the able guidance of Jagdish Chandra, sir. So excellent presentation and big congratulations, Dr. Thank Ajay you. and team. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So uh, it was a great learning experience for all of thank us. You. So with this, we close the session. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.